Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Yi Tsi. I'm your host today for the webinar. Welcome to the webinar, How to Make Your Vulnerability Management Program Pay Dividends today. The webinar session today will be recorded and we'll be taking questions during and after the webinar. So if you have any burning questions or just things that you want to chat, just type into the chat box and I'll read it out at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to John Stock, our Vulnerability Management Product Manager. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm just going to take you through a, a little bit on how to make your VM program more worthwhile and make it more beneficial for you. So I'll uh, I'll crack on with the slides. Um, so a very quick bit about our post 24. So we've been going since 2001 doing vulnerability management um, from various sides. So the application side, the network security side, um, and now going into the cloud and container side. Um, Essentially, we like to help people fix their security um, in terms of making them more secure. It's what we, we like doing. So the good thing is there's a lot of passion and we enjoy doing it. Um, quite a lot of us do this kind of thing for fun and hobbies as well, which is not always bad. But uh, yeah, we, we're nerds like that. Um, we've got about 2,000 customers now in various regions of the world. And we love breaking technology. It's one of the things we, we pride ourselves in and we enjoy doing. Um, our professional services team do a lot of that. We've got a, you know, quite a few CVEs to our name in terms of um, things that we've broken and had to report to vendors and they've come back to us with fixes. So that's what we like doing. So that's, that's who we are. Um, and then a little bit more around what I'm doing today. Um, quite a lot of us have come from a background where we've actually had to run VM programs. So I've run a VM program for a, uh, a large company in the uh, UK and small bits of Europe as well, but predominantly in the UK, where we've had to uh, had to bring in a VM program where there was various bits of resistance and various problems that we had. Um, and by the time I finished that job and left, we had a very successful VM program. And I still rate the success of that VM program by the fact that they're big enough um, to be noticed by people, but I've not seen them on the news to say they've been hacked. So for me, that's a, a sign that I haven't been there for 10 years now and I still haven't seen them on the news. So for me, that's a, that's a benefit thing to see. So on today's topic, just to give you a run through on what I'm going to go through, a few, few headers here. So why risk is the new normal, um, how we can adapt to the threat landscape and what that changing threat landscape is, um, bringing in that business context um, that makes a VM program work and then some business alignment remediation. So rather than working as a security person, working with the business to say, well, actually, we understand what you're saying and let's see if we can work together rather than, yeah, I'm security, you do what you say, we say, which is a common one that I come across when I'm talking to people now. Um, and this view is from a business perspective. So in terms of what I'm going to be talking about, this is not a technical talk. This is all around um, the business perspective. So if you're expecting a, a technical thing or if you're a very technical person, then essentially strap in because this is going to be a hell of a ride for you because it's all around business, not technical, I'm afraid. But we uh, we kind of have to get the business built in before we can before we can get to the technical part. So. Why is risk the new normal? So we we hear two people talking about risk a lot of times, you know, oh, it's a high risk, medium and low risk. And then there's that the whole process around accepting risks. And yes, it's a risk, but I'm not too worried about that. So humans, we like to take risks. You know, people love taking risks. So I'm not a big fan of it myself. Getting older, I, I have this fear of uh, dying these days. Um, but human nature, we will take risks. Yeah, you know, people love bungee jumping and doing these huge swings off things. And you know, people hanging their kids off of these big rocks, and it, it looks really scary. But often, everything is not quite what it seems because risk has been normalised. You know, oh, we can't fix that. We can accept that risk. But that risk may be greater than we think but we're just normalized to the idea of accepting that the risk is there but we're not always seeing the whole picture of, of what that that risk essentially is now how do we quantify risk a lot of the time we quantify risk by numbers um, it's the simplest way you know, 
that risk is a zero. Okay, there's no risk there. That risk is a 10. Oh, that's a bad risk. God's panic now. Um, and the most common one is CVSS. So um, hopefully everybody here has heard of the CVSS scoring system where we have a, an informational risk of zero um, all the way up to a high risk, which they rate a 10. Now, CVS is the de facto standard that everybody uses. I mean, a lot, some some people come up with their own risk scoring, but everything contains some element of CVSS. Now, CVSS version two, it seems to be the de facto standard now. CVSS version three is available. Um, it was ratified sometime around June 2015. So you know, we're talking three years ago now, but it's still not widely adopted. People are still falling back to those CVSS version two scoring. So interesting fact is that CVSS version two was actually finalized and hasn't really changed since 2007. Um, that was when they um, first kind of came up with the first drug, the first run through of CVSS that was formalized. So they had drafts before that, but in 2007, that was the the finalized version of this is when it's going to be. There have been some changes, wording and things like that, but nothing major, um, which doesn't sound too far away. I was like 2007, that's not long ago. But when you think 11 years ago, um, that was the year they announced the first iPhone. So before that, everybody had a BlackBerry. Um, seems like a long time ago when you put it that way. Um, the A380 made its first commercial flight. So now they can't even sell the things and they're taking them offline and using them for parts. And at the time, that was like this amazing plane that could had two levels and can take lots of people. But the technology has moved on. It's not all about volume. It's all about saving money now. Um, the nerd moments is that it was the year that they released the very last Harry Potter book. And also for the Formula One fan like me, um, it was the year that Kimi Raikkonen won his one and only Formula One World Championship, which does seem like a long time ago. So those are the, some of the things that happened in 2007. So that's that's a long while ago. The big thing being the iPhone. You know, it's hard to imagine everyone not having their face glued to their iPhone. And in those days, it was all around BlackBerry and BlackBerry Messenger was the thing to have. So you can just see how far technology has come on, yet we're you still using a risk score standard that was around before the iPhone. Um, so why do we accept risk? You know, risk is something that is there. We have a tool to score that risk in CVSS, but why do we accept them? Um, one of those reasons is knowledge. We don't know how to fix them. We've got a problem. We should maybe fix it. We should patch, but we don't know how. Um, we don't have the expertise. We don't know what impact that may have. Business support, we need it like that. Um, we've probably all heard that. Oh, you're running this application that you use for recording customer service calls. Um, it's running with PHP version two, which is ancient. Um, that's really old. You shouldn't be running that and it's full of vulnerabilities and the business turns around and says, but it does the job. We're not going to change. We haven't got the money to change. We need it like that. So the first thing people do is, well, we'll accept that risk because the business say we need it. Therefore, we have to run it. And the last one is time. We don't have time to test and fix. So hopefully people don't roll um, big fixes out into a live production environment without at least testing them first. But often you people will come back and say, I don't have the time to test and fix this. I've got all my operational work to do to then go back and say, oh, I've now got you know, 500 servers that I have to you know, with different applications on. So we have to test the update to see if it's going to impact this this application and then find out if it's going to work. And then we can roll it out to all of our servers. Um, it takes time. We know it takes time and there could be problems in that. So time is a big problem that people often have. So what should we do to try and get around those? So obviously, if there's a problem, we need a fix for that problem. So for knowledge, speak to vendors. Um, often you'll find that the vendors themselves have a, you know, a lot of experience with, oh, yeah, we have another customer who that has that exact scenario. Um, what you need to do is do A, B, and C. So if we look at the recent Microsoft update that um, uh, summer, 
there was a summer update or spring update that recently went out. One of the things you had to do was turn off BitLocker on your machine because if you ran the update with BitLocker on, it could cause problems or it would take three or four days to install the update. Um, if you didn't know that, you didn't read the support articles or contact the vendor, you wouldn't know you'd do that. Suddenly you've got thousands of laptops that can't update because they're in a three day update cycle. So getting the information from the vendors is critically important for these things. Um, and the second one is consider a knowledge matrix. So it's something we had in my previous job where some of us had moved around the company. So I was a telecoms engineer first. And before that, I was a system administrator on things like OS2 Warp and Windows NT 3.5, which doesn't age me at all. Um, but I knew, I knew my telecoms, I knew my Windows, basic Windows, okay, but my telecoms knowledge was still pretty good. I can still, if I ever came across them, configure a Nortel router or a switch from the top of my head. Um, I wish I could use that part of my brain for something useful to me now, but it's still in there. Um, and one of the things we did was we did a knowledge matrix to say, okay, John's in the security team, but he's had experience of working with Norta, working with telephony and PSTNs and things like that. So if there was a question that needed answering and no one was available, there's a chance I could help. Um, so because people move around jobs, you don't stay static these days. Um, he says working here for 10 years, but I, I've done a lot of different jobs in the same place. So I still get people coming to me now. I know you don't do this anymore, but we've got this issue, this problem. Please, can you help us? Because we need someone to just sanity check it before we go through with it. So the idea of a knowledge matrix means you're just tapping into the resources you already have. There's no extra cost to it, but there may be someone who can actually solve that problem without you having to panic or call someone when they're on holiday or something like that. Business support, you know, we're all here to support a business of some, some point and form. Um, the first things you need to ask is why do they need it? So if it's a critical thing, Yes, OK, understand they need it. Some things are just nice to have. And I've come across them before in my previous role where you know, our customer service team had particular applications they were running and only three people out of a team of about 160 of them actually used it. But as far as they were concerned, it'd been marked as critical for these three people, even though it, there was a new tool in place that was doing the same thing. But these three people just liked the old one or always used the old one, had no intention of change. So. Why do they need it? And essentially, can it be changed? So is there a new version of the software from the vendor which supports latest ones? Can we contact the vendor and say, we're still using this, we're still paying for support, what's the upgrade path? Because often when you're paying for support for software, there is an upgrade path. Um, it's not always a simple one, but there's generally an upgrade that you can do to bring you to the latest version. No software company in the world wants you to be hacked because of their product. Even if you're running an end of life product or something, you don't want the word to get out that, oh yeah, we had a breach because of product X. Even if you were running an out of out of end of line, out of date version, it doesn't matter. They've still got your name of it, name attached to it. So nobody wants that. So vendors are very good at pushing pushing updates and getting people to change. And the last one is time. Um, there is no fix for time. You know, if we could ex add an extra 10 hours in the day, I'm sure we all would, although I'm sure that would be 10 hours extra from when we finish work to when we start work the next day. But we can't make more time. But what we can do is try and understand the business risk of not having those vulnerabilities. You know, what is the business risk? And does the business find that risk acceptable? If we can't patch the... Uh, palm patch the PCI environment because we don't have the time or the resources to do this out of hours, is that acceptable to the business that we can't do that? And if that's not acceptable, then they have to make a decision what stuff doesn't doesn't go on the list of things to do. Do you make these new firewall changes because they want to access some new WYSI website because they want to read things or is updating the PCI more envi environment more important? So it's all about getting the business to understand the risk of these things and forcing them to give you time to actually do these things. So Got an understanding of you know why we accept risks, some of the reasons that we can get around accepting those risks, but our, the landscape that we're working in is changing. You know, as security people, we work, you know, or 
being in my 40s, I'm used to a more traditional um, security layout. So this kind of, you know, you have switches, firewalls, VLANs, um, private WANs, public WANs, the internet, um, but the internet was just that. It was used for web browsing and email and things like that. So traditionally, that's been the view. However, that's changing quite a lot and security is less and less in our hands now. Um, the cloud is the big thing, you know, why do we need to have all this on-premise equipment when we can have, use someone else's equipment or a share of their equipment? Um, why do we need all these firewalls when we can use security groups in AWS and it'll do the same job, but fa save us 50,000 euros a year. Um, there's a lot of different things that we, we are actually moving towards and that putting security less and less in our hands with less bits of tin that we can we can actually see. So essentially, what is our greatest point of exposure? Um, now, when you talk to people and say, right, what's the biggest risk to us? You'll see the same sorts of things. Our web servers are, our mail servers are, our cloud infrastructure, a lack of patching, our mobile applications. You know, if you're a bank and you've got a mobile banking application, is there, it's particularly with Android and the number of um, rooted Android devices if someone's running in it can someone inject something in there and steal that data out and log into someone else's else's banking environment um, so there's a common set of things that we hear when we're talking to people about exposure um, unfortunately it's none of those it's a completely non-technical one so during Info Security Europe this year we kind of surveyed 269 people and 63% of those agreed that the biggest or went for that the biggest risk to them is social engineering. It's the human factor. It's not the technical thing of your web server or your mail server. It's the human factor of someone's being nice to me. I should do what they say. Um, it's a very British stance as well. The whole, if someone says, please, can you, we will say yes. Um, apart from please, can you let some goals in tonight? In fact, we will say no, but it's a very, very nice we're in a polite society these days where people will say yes because we want to be helpful we want to be that helpful person um that's not always a good thing and other things other ways we look at it is that social engineering isn't just phoning someone up or tricking your way in through a door you know it's people trying to be able to do what they want by bypassing the controls you've put in place so this i had to change my slides this morning because i read this one this morning um so a Navy engineer in the US decided to, uh, he wanted to steal some data from about the Navy Navy drones, um, which go in the sea, not in the sky. Um, so he just stuffed his stuff on his personal Dropbox. Now, personally, I wouldn't have allowed personal Dropboxes or Dropbox at all, in fact, um, in that kind of environment. But they may have had all these things, USB may have been locked down, so he couldn't plug his USB in, he couldn't plug his phone in to get the data there. Um, he couldn't email files out via the um, the mail system because it wouldn't allow that kind of file to be sent out or files over a certain size. There could have been 101 different controls in there, yet all this guy had to do was install Dropbox and drag and drop the data over. Easy as that. Um, so it is the human element. And as we all know, there are two things in what you can always rely on um, that the infinite is the inf universe is infinite and is humans are stupid. You know, we we all are. It's it's one of the things humanity seems to pride itself is our, our innate stupidity and our innate cleverness as well. Because people are cleverly stupid. Now, it doesn't make sense, but um, we will put things in there to stop people doing things and people will get around them. It's what's going to happen. People use what's convenient. If they don't have the ability to get their job done, um, they'll find their own way to do it. You know, so if we can't provide the tools or we're blocking them, so security are often seen as blockers. If we're saying, no, you can't get to this website because X, Y, and Z, um, you know, someone from HR or someone from customer service says, okay, no, fine, we can't go there. And all they do is Google free proxies. And then you find they've installed a Chrome extension. And that Chrome extension is actually taking data that they're browsing from Chrome and farming it off somewhere else. Um, yeah, it can be some of the bad Chrome extensions that have been found previously to steal credentials when you're logging into websites. Um, there's been a lot of a lot of bad things going on. But if they don't have the tools to do the job and we don't enable people to do the job, they're going to find ways around it. Um, and the easiest way I've found that is just assume that if you say no to someone, 
they will find a way around it. Doesn't mean they're doing it in a malicious way. They're not trying to hurt the business because no business, no job. Um, but they're just trying to find a way to do do what they want in the end. And users are data driven. So the important thing here is the data at rest. Um, so as we saw from the previous one where the guy decided to steal all the uh, the Navy drone secrets um, or the trade secrets, possibly not as bad as top secret, but bad enough. Um, your data at rest can be anywhere. You know, for this guy, he put it in Dropbox, but we can have highly confidential data that people can say, oh, yeah, I need to use that later, but I have to go through all these hoops to sign in to our secure vault, so our secure storage, and that just takes me three minutes of my day, and I haven't got three minutes of my data to spend doing that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy that data and put it in this open share here that I can access at any point in time. So if I'm yeah, on my iPad up in the canteen, I can look on my iPad, I can access that data, data and see who I've got to phone this afternoon, who I've got to speak to, you know, what cards we've got to process, that kind of thing. The big problem is things like GDPR and PCI are making losing that data very, very, very expensive. Um, you know, people have in the past, oh yeah, we had a data loss. Oh, that's embarrassing. Now it's we've had a data loss that is really embarrassing, and we're going to have to pay a lot of money for it um, because they don't want you to lose your data. And the biggest way to hurt any business by taking money off them. So. At the end of the day, how do we rationalize the data's risk? So what is the risk to that data? Well, the user isn't the only risk. So our data risk is in the middle. So this looks a bit like Mickey Mouse. Um, we have our data risk in the middle. Now, the first risk is the user, the user accessing it. As soon as the user accesses your data, that data is at risk of being shared, being moved somewhere it shouldn't be. But taking the user out of the equation, we then add the server risk in, which is the traditional vulnerability management risk that we we know and love in that that vulnerability that that web server or sorry that data server has um an smb vulnerability in it so i can i can attack the windows access on it um, and i can access that data but we add in a user risk and essentially our risk grows but it's not one server and one risk it's lots of users and it's probably on a server farm. So it's not just one server, it's lots of servers. And you can suddenly see that the data is more and more at risk. The more people that have access to it, the more the risk grows. But when we're talking about VM traditionally, all we've been looking at is the server risk. So we're looking at the infrastructure, what's the risk there? So one of the things we're doing now is trying to build in that user risk. So is there a risk for those users accessing that data? Um, as well as that server risk. So if the server's fully patched, no risks whatsoever, excellent. But your users are still a risk. If you've got no users accessing your data, well, you probably need to just delete it anyway. But it's making sure that that risk is taken as a whole and not as uh, single little commodities on their own, which gives you a smaller risk and you're not seeing the whole picture. And at the end of the day, after all of that, and we've understood our risks and got an idea of what our risks are, we need to work with the business. You know, working on our own as a security team isn't going to help. Security needs the business and the business needs security. So it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship. You know, we need them, they need us. Um, between the two of us, well, we can we can fix most things. Um, and it's no good going alone on these things. So the business context can bring focus to a vulnerability management program. And that has been one of the things that has meant, you know, helped me build a vulnerability management program previously is that as soon as you bring context, business context into it, you get focus into what needs to be done. Security will always focus on control. You know, what we want to control access, we want to control what is where, who can access what. And security isn't just firewalls, it's user access and things like that. But we we need to kind of get out of that we want to be restrictive and start to understand what the business needs to operate because what's important for them is time availability and yesterday you know every time you say to them when is the deadline they'll say oh well can you do it now because i really needed this yesterday um happens all the time i still hear it now but the business will always focus on that and the two aren't necessarily separate um the goals aren't that that different from each other. So, you know, from a security point of view, 
I'm talking about a set of IP addresses. I'm talking about the server IP range. In the business view, that's where the, data, the important data is held. Um, from a security point of view, I talk about user subnets. Business point of view, that's where they work. That's where their laptops are plugged in or their desktops, and that's where they actually do their day-to-day -day work. Um, from a security point of view, we have web servers which must be patched because they're on the internet, they're visible by everyone, and they are the first point that someone's going to try and break in. Um, to our business, that's our customer's view of the company. If the website has any downtime, then people look at us and go, oh, your website was down, that's a bit shifty. Why was that down? Are you being attacked? Is there a problem? Um, downtime always looks bad for a website. And then the last one I've got here, the, the security view is our annual PCI compliance. Yeah, we've got ASV scans, we've got pen tests, we've got the self self service questionnaire we have to fill in. As far as the business is concerned, that's how the customers pay. That's how they give us money. That's the most important thing to them. Um, they don't care about you know, running ASV scans every quarter and getting a pen test and a web app pen test and filling in this questionnaire, having different VLANs, talking foreign languages to them. Um, what they know is that's how the customers pay. If that environment isn't available, the customers can't give us money, the business loses money, and businesses losing money is something to security people we don't want to be responsible for. So the first thing to get around that is to understand why the business may be reluctant and update to fix. There's uh, that fear of change. Um, so are there any historical problems? So has previously something gone wrong um, and they've not been able to work the business has not been able to work um, for any significant amount of time. So often it could have been a year ago, two years ago, but you can bet your bottom dollar, they will come back to you and say, yeah, I remember this one time you updated and we had an outage for like a day and a half and yeah, we can't have that again. So no, you can't do it. It, it happens all the time. You know, the business never forgets. Um, and there is that fear of downtime. The fear of downtime is, oh, you need to patch them? Yeah, yeah. How, you going, how long are you going to be down for? Oh, about 10 minutes. Can you make it five? Well, no, we can't do it less than five. Oh, how about we do it in three weeks? We might not be so busy then. Three weeks comes, they're still busy. They need to change everything again. So there's a fear of downtime as well. So fear of Fear of not something not being available, which needs to fear of lost productivity. Now, if things aren't around because they're being patched, and yes, you can patch out of hours. You know, my my previous few cars have all been paid from overtime from doing patching out of hours. It's been wonderful, but these days there is no out of hours. You know, what's three o'clock in the afternoon in the UK? A nice quiet afternoon is peak time in the US. So, yeah, and there's no very few, I would say no, but very few companies which aren't global now, you know, websites aren't restricted to, you can only see this in the UK. Well, there are a few, BBC iPlayer, when I was trying to watch some football, when I was in another country, couldn't watch it, iPlayer said, no, you're not in the right country. Um, but most things these days are global. So um, that the idea of doing downtime out of hours is not really not really something you can do it during quiet times but it's really impossible to understand the idea of there is no out of hours time anymore so essentially we have to establish what is critical to the business and then make sure we can speak their language so rather than saying we have to patch the up the um, pci environment if we don't update this environment we'll no longer be able to accept car payments so having half an hour's downtime tomorrow at three o'clock in the morning when we may have one customer who can't do it or we lose our accreditation and we can't take it from anybody. Um, you know, it's a business choice, but you've just got to put it on the line, give them the honest answer, get some buy-in from yeah, C-level people, um, see, see if you can engage in that level. Remember, it's the CISO whose butt is on the line um, and he's also the guy who should be looking at security as well. So try and engage at that level. But if we don't update the environment, we can't do this and the business impact is gonna be massive. Um, another example, if we don't update the customer service servers, we're at risk of not being able to provide a service to our existing customers. No one ha hates, no one likes phoning up a help desk and they say, oh, our computers aren't working at the more. I 
had it last week and it frustrates me no end. Um, I don't mind on a Monday morning, first thing Monday morning, you know, people haven't had enough coffee, they're just, the machines are just booting up, everything's a bit clunky after a weekend off. Um, but when you phone them like Wednesday lunchtime, you're like, yeah, I need to change my phone contract. Okay, yeah, oh, our computers have gone slow. Um, can I just put you on hold a minute? Wait, I look, and then you're on hold for 10 minutes listening to a stretched cassette tape from their old fashioned hold system and just driving you slightly crazy. Um, but if you can't provide that customer support to your customers, then you know, your customers are not gonna be happy and an ha unhappy customer goes to a competitor, a happy customer stays. So once you start putting the business context and talking about the customer service thing, in fact, all you're doing is you're just giving the, giving the business I need to update these service because we haven't been updated and you know we're behind on our patching, but you're telling them the same information in language that they understand and has meaning to them. And the last one, there's a security flaw in our website. You may have seen it in the news recently. We need to ensure we are protected. As soon as you start bringing in the news, um, especially on that CISO level, that they, they listen. Uh, you know, it was heartbleed, things like that. As soon as, you know, talking to friends of mine who are still working where I used to work, they said as soon as that was on the news, the business was coming to them saying, are we protected? Can you get us protected? We need to be protected from this. Um, so it's really encouraging to see that the business coming and asking security questions. And for them, it was even better that they could say, yes, we did this already. Um, and that kind of improved that business security relationship. The business is worried about something because they've seen it on the news. The security team has already done it. And then somewhere in the middle, they're like patting each other on the back, having coffee. And then, you know, in happy, happy medium. It's business language, but with security responsibilities. So at the end of all that, what should we, what sort of information should we be taking away from this? So just because risk is normalized, that doesn't mean we need to accept it because people, other people are happy to accept risk because you know, some people accept risk doesn't mean we shouldn't question every time a risk is accepted. Yeah, we don't need to update that certificate. This It's a self-signed certificate on a firewall. Okay, why have we got a self-signed certificate on the firewall? Can we, is there any reason we can't put a real one on? Well, we have to pay $100 a year for this. We've got a thousand firewalls um, and there's no point. There's only administrators are connecting and they understand the risk. Fantastic, I'd accept that risk any day um, because if someone's connecting to the firewall that doesn't understand the self-signed certificate, then they probably shouldn't be connecting to the firewall in the first place. Our data is our key asset. So without it, we'd end up driving for Uber. Yeah, there's, or well, I was going to put in flipping burgers in McDonald's, all these kinds of things, the jobs that we really don't want to do um, because we like sitting in front of a computer all day. But our data is our key asset. Without that, you know, there is no business. The business needs the data. So we need to make sure that data is protected, both from our users and from other people who have bad ideas of what they'd like to do with it. And to be honest, we have no option. Yeah, compliance requirements, whether it's GDPR, whether it's PCI, whether it's Sarbanes-Oxley, there's a whole list of compliance things that I can throw in this direction um, and they will force your hand. And if you fail, it will cost money. So it's not an option of, oh, maybe we can do this or maybe we should secure that. It's a case of we need to secure it and when can we work with the business to make sure that's done and engage with the business you know let them think security is their idea so that example just now with Hartley being in the news and them coming and saying oh have we done this they thought they were awesome because they were being security minded and they kind of were like yeah we were pushing this we really needed it done as soon as the business starts to get security minded and they're thinking like that your job becomes so much easier you know, any vm program in case of, where you're looking to reduce risks you're looking to improve the stability and the foundation of the company in terms of it um that needs the business to actually embrace that and push that and as soon as they think it's their idea then you've won the game you know that's that's there and it could be through um security awareness programs as a very 
basic minimal level so that the actual end users understand security. You know, it's, I've been there where I've faked a whole ton of web, lo web access logs and then I had a screen that just flicked through and we were doing this roadshow and people looked at it and said, oh, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's people accessing the internet right now. Really, you can see all that? Oh yeah, um, it was a complete fake, but it made them scared and it made them realize that we, you know, we can see what they're doing. Um, and then when they start asking questions, you start, okay, it's not real, but this is the amount of traffic we see, this is the volume. And if any one of those is a risk to the business, then there's bad things and we need to be able to pick that out of that whole amount of information. And then they start to get an idea of the, what you're up against you know it's not us trying to say no you can't do that it's us saying you can't do it because the risk to the business is so high so it's getting people to have an idea of what what they're actually up against so just as a a last couple of slides so this is your net you know it, it's a stealth bomber this is your next data breach ddos ransomware or hacktivist attack unfortunately this is all you will see of it. You won't see it coming. The world's best stealth bomber will be invisible. You'd never see it. And that's essentially where we are. The next thing that's coming, we won't see it. Um, we will know as soon as our CISO or somebody comes around and starts shouting at us that we've cost them a lot of money. They need, you know, we've had this breach. We're all over the news. And that's the first time a lot of us will see it. Right. That's the end. Um, Q and A time now. So if anyone has any questions or anything they right. need to ask, fire right. away. Thank, thank you very much, John, for the fresh take on vulnerability management. Um, I've got some uh, questions coming in already, uh, but uh, please continue to type them in, and I'll read it out to John for now. So the first one I have is: uh, Does the frequency of assessment have an impact on quality? So does it mean the more you you scan, the better you get? That's a double-edged sword. So it's yes and no. Um, the volume and the increased data that you get can sometimes just mean you can't see the wood for the trees, which is a really awful saying. I hate it, but it's so true. Um, if you find that if you're scanning 10,000 workstations, you need to concentrate on the anomalies. So scanning those every day is going to be useless because you can't patch every day. So if you can patch once every month, um, if you can patch once every two months, then you should have your scanning in line with that. And the one thing I was talking to a customer last week, I went to visit them, uh, we were sat there talking about their VM program. And one of the things that I brought up, they were like, we never thought it about it like that, is they always scanned just after Patch Tuesday just after all the Microsoft patches had come out and they, everybody knew about them, we had all the vulnerability checks in there, then they'd scan and we'd tell them that they were vulnerable to all of them, which wouldn't be much of a surprise to them because they knew that. But then they'd scan the next month after the patches had come out and they'd have a whole new load. So rather than concentrating on what they'd fixed, they were more focused on what had just come out to them um, that they had no chance of fixing for at least another two to three weeks. So it's not only about timing, but frequency is one of those, we scan as often as you can patch. If you can only patch once every six months, okay, scan more frequently. Um, but as a minimum, I'd say once a month, um, as in a maximum once a week. And there's technology we have built in called scanning this scanning, which if something new comes out in between those two scans, then we can actually tell you about it. So if you're running a certain version of Apache and a new vulnerability comes out for that version of Apache, then we don't have a 100% guaranteed view that you're vulnerable to it, but we can give you a heads up and say, well, based on the version that you're running, we think you're vulnerable to it. So it doesn't necessarily give you better data, but it will certainly give you more data. And finding the anomalies in sheer volumes of data can actually take away the focus of the whole VM program. Okay, great. And I've got another one here for you. So the difference between CVSS version three and two, what's the difference? And is it just a improving, uh, improved version or? So CVSS v3 and v2 are scarily similar. Um, the big difference between CVSS v3 um, is that it has something called scope in there. And the big thing around the scope scoring is whether that vulnerability will actually impact the local machine or if it has 
the ability to impact further down the whole application chain um, of that machine. So it just allows for some contextualization. So it's better, but it's still a standalone number. Now, there's no business context in that. And there's again, it allows for some contextualization. So you still got the same CIA, CIA metrics. So you know, if confidentiality is important, then it will in, increase the amount, the score of anything that impacts confidentiality. The same with integrity and the same with availability. But it's a single point score. And I'm not a big fan of single point scores because sometimes it doesn't give you the whole story of actually what you're up against. So it's an improvement, but it's not the best thing you'll see. Right. Um, thank you. I've got another one here. Uh, so how important is it to access all data? So do we usually just do the critical ones? And what about the non-critical one? Do we just ignore that? <laughs> So critical ones, obviously, yes, you, you always want to um, scan your critical assets, but less critical ones. So I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier. If you've got a you know, thousand, two thousand workstations and they're all off of the same gold build and you have users accessing them. So in a call center or something like that, where nobody has extra access to them, there's no one's got domain admin rights or no one's got local admin rights. So they've all got the same access. Um, do you really need 1,000 sets of the same information? Probably not. Um, so it's all about taking a, a pointed view of if I scan all 1,000 of them, then I'm going to get 1,000 instances of the same data. And again, going to get flooded with data. Everything's going to be a nightmare to look through. But why not scan a set of them? Why not scan 20 a month or pick random ones every month, scan those? or run random scans when you feel like it against them just to make sure they're up to scratch with what your goal build should be. Um, we have customers and one of the things I actually used to do and I encourage people to do it is have a machine um, that is your goal build that just sits in a server rack somewhere um, and just chugs away all day. Nothing happens to it. It should be self all the same update mechanisms, everything like that. And that is the one you vulnerability scan as frequently as you would patch it. It has all the patches going to it, um, but that's your gold standard of I've got a problem with this one. Therefore, I know I've got a problem with the other thousand odd that are out um, with my with my call center, with my customer service people. No problems with that can't guarantee you're not going to have problems with the other ones because something may have gone awry somewhere with a, a, an update package or something but it does mean that you're not scanning lots of instances of the same thing to get exactly the same information right thank you and i think we got time for only last questions so at um from your experience working with clients at what level should i try to engage my business about security so Good question and an important one as well. Um, so it's always hard. So as a security guy, I always found that, you know, you're kind of at the bottom of the pile. You have a, an IT security manager above you, or if you're the IT security manager, you may have someone above you. In, in my previous role, I actually reported to the IT security manager who reported to the CFO, which was an interesting one. Um, but some of the technology teams reported into the CFO. But the most important person to get on board is the CISO. So the important word in the in his job title it gives it away is the chief information security officer. So if any of your data is lost or any of your data is compromised, it's his butt that's on the line. Um, at the end of the day, the CEO is going to look to him and say, why did you let this happen? Why has this happened? What can we do about it? You know, why are we in the news because of it? He's the one who's going to get get the can for it. So the higher up the organization um, that you can get this buy-in, then the more successful you will be. It's a case of, I've, so to start the process, I kind of, when we started on our VM program, I'd run through the program, got it all set up, all my scans, and I'd give teams to the mid, give reports to the mid-range team, out to the AIX team, out to the Wintel team, um, to the network team. And I was like, oh, done awesome here did a scan another month, next month, no changes. In fact, it got worse. Next month, it got worse again. And I'm like, well, no one's done anything. And they're like, oh, we haven't got any time. 
I'm like, okay, speak to my boss. They're like, well, I can't do anything. I'll talk to their managers and say it's important, but can't force them to do anything. So in the end, we had, you know, review meetings and everything. And we decided that the only way we were going to get this done was to speak to the CISO. Spoke to the CISO and the next month the vulnerabilities went down. And then the next month they went down again. And then our, we kind of found that we had that buy-in and things were getting fixed. And then we did the same thing um, with the business as well. So once we got the technical team sorted, the next task was the business. And the CISO went to our uh, customer services manager and went, this is our problem. This is how we need to fix it. Um, we need to kind of speak with you and make sure so i ended up talking to one of the managers from the customer services team and we explained we went backwards and forwards about what his problems were with the security in the past what my problems are with custom services and kind of found common ground that actually they were the same things we were just using a different language and once we'd found a language that we both understood um we could kind of make sure that we kind of were had some synergy between us. And at that point, we found that, yeah, you know, oh, there's this vulnerability we've got to fix, it's gonna affect this. They're like, great, when can you do it? As soon as possible, please. And it was like, whoa, okay, yeah, we can do it tonight if that's okay, awesome. Midnight, all right? Yeah, that's fine, perfect, thanks. And you'd find that, that okay, then we had emergency change records and things to raise, but that's just paperwork. Um, but once we had that buy-in, then they were pushing us to do it, or they'd approach us and say, we're looking at this new application. Can you tell us the security implications of it? And suddenly, business, the security was their idea. So once you've got the right people on board and the higher up the level you can engage, the more beneficial it will be and the quicker things will happen. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. This is all we have time for today. And uh, the webinar is recorded and I'll send out the recording and the presentation after the event today. And our next webinar in August will be around application security uh, in the DevOps world. Thank you very much for attending and see you soon.